I think we are streaming live. I think we are ready to start. Oh, not yet, Mr. Mohammed. Yes, we are. Uh, we are live. We are live. Welcome everybody to this uh, very interesting and uh, uh, topical workshop within the uh, Tunis Innovation Week. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Mohammed Al Jafari. I am uh, currently in a very cold corner in a very cold country in Jordan, uh, where I am the director of the Intellectual Property Commercialization Office uh, at the Royal Scientific Society. Uh, we are expecting, so we had snow this morning and we are having snow again this evening. So uh, right now the talk about global warming is not exactly present in our minds, but present in our minds is that we are seeing more and more flash floods every day. Uh, we are, as a humanity, facing big problems every day. As a humanity, our chronic issues with waste and uh, disease and uh, resource, uh, uh, resource security, they are becoming acute. Uh, whatever time we thought we had, we have much less, apparently. And every day we look at a clock ticking down and we look for science, scientists to help resolve this uh, ridiculous situation, which is why technology transfer is more and more an urgent and present and important situation, okay? It's not the solution to everything, but the inefficiency of uh, translating uh, research outcomes into uh, societal benefits, this cannot go on forever. We, we, we cannot afford it anymore. We need our uh, scientists uh, to be able to produce solutions, we need mechanisms and brokers and startups and entrepreneurs and large industry to mobilize these solutions towards uh, societal benefit, whether or not uh, the scientists are on board would be welcome, of course, but I don't think it is uh, anymore a question of uh, uh, if, it is a question of when. So. As such, technology transfer, as the name implies, is an active participation, okay? It's an active process. Technology will spread around the world. This is the nature of technology. But this spread is a diffusion spread. It's a passive spread and it happens on its own. And again, in order to increase the efficiency and increase the uptake, we need to change the diffusion into a transfer. And this is where technology transfer comes in. There's going to be a technology donor. There's going to be a technology recipient. And there's a process between them, this uh, gray mystery of a black box called the uh, technology transfer. And this is the disambiguation that we are going to see today through our next, I think, six speakers. Very interesting topics uh, attacking this subject from many angles. I hope that uh, researchers, investors, uh, entrepreneurs will be able to take something home from this uh, workshop and will be able to learn and help us solve the problems that we are looking at. Yeah, we are uh, heading towards uh, extinction level events and uh, we're going to need you scientists and investors to work a little bit more closely. Speaking of working closely, a very close friend of mine and somebody who I have worked very closely with many times before, uh, uh, Alberto Soracci, uh, the technologist at uh, as Aria Science Park, is going to be giving us uh, the first presentation today. And the presentation, which will last for 20 minutes, I think, including questions and answers, is uh, constraints and barriers faced by technology transfer offices in the EU MPC region addressing WEF Nexus challenges. I am very interested in that because we know the challenges facing uh, technology transfer offices, but there is a specific group of challenges for offices dealing in this area. So, Alberto. It gives me great pleasure to give you the floor. 
please uh, uh, go ahead and enlighten us. Uh, by the way, uh, I will be able to see for the participants looking, uh, viewing us from outside, uh, please feel free to pose your questions and comments on the chat and uh, in the Q&A, and we will be able to pick up after each presentation. Maybe we can give about uh, five or seven minutes for discussion amongst uh, ourselves and uh, as guided by the questions. Alberto, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, really, Ahmed. Uh, it's uh, a real pleasure to be to be here and to see some very close and, uh, and old friends. So, I have to, to say thank you for what you said. For what you said, because it's extremely interesting uh, how you uh, the link between the challenges that we are facing and how we are able to spread innovation. Uh, I think that uh, technology transfer, as we said many times uh, also together, is really a, a, a key to spread innovation. Uh, also, because uh, it is a wheel chain that uh, that allows uh, uh, science to reach the innovation to solve concretely the the, the challenge. Uh, I, I will try today to share uh, uh, if I'm uh, so lucky to to push the right uh, button to to share with you uh, some work that was done. Um, few years ago uh, and also you maybe you don't remember but also you you, uh, you um, contribute uh, in doing uh, Hemon uh, and Fear and maybe uh, also contribute to do this uh, this work uh, so what was done and uh, what we will uh, I will show you is uh, uh, the work that was done in order to to understand which are the uh, the barriers and the motivators to support this flow of, uh, of know-how from uh, scientists to innovators. The first point that I, I need to remember to all of us, also to set the scene, is that, uh, as Mohamed said, the technology transfer doesn't come alone. We have always a knowledge creator that is usually done within the research and industries and universities and the uh, knowledge adopters, so the commercialization, the industries, and the government, according also to what was the triple helix model. So this uh, flow of innovation is called the knowledge sharing, the interactive uh, uh, um, cycle of knowledge sharing, where technology transfer, knowledge transfer, they have a key, a key role. To, in order to understand the gaps, why this, uh, uh, the knowledge doesn't reach exactly well uh, and immediately the, the innovators that are the companies at the end, uh, many, many studies have been done. With the, uh, one of the first one that I remember is the Yadra 2020 that was done in, our, in the Mediterranean partner country to, to look at the knowledge gap in the, in the energy sector. Then another survey was done at the European level, and the Five for I was the project was uh, mapped in all the Mediterranean countries uh, the uh, those barriers and constraints that we face. But why we do this? Why we are so interested in understanding which is the level the level of uh, capacity to transfer science? to innovation, as Mohamed said. First of all, it has an impact. It has been proved that it has an impact on the GDP. And if we look at the GDP in research and innovation spent in the southern Mediterranean region, we see that there is a gap considering the average in the OECD countries. Going uh, more in deep, uh, uh, before to show you the, the, the result, uh, what was done in, those, uh, in this work in 2018-2019 was, uh, uh, was to do a, um, a wide literary re review with uh, also in order to understanding the, the barriers. Was also done a large face to face interview in 12 countries in order to speak with the key player 
in the science and in the innovation side. And maybe some of you also received at the time some um, questionnaires in order to fill it by researchers and entrepreneurs in all the Mediterranean partner countries in order to understand which are the perceived barriers. We have to say that this was the most extended analysis done at the time on this field. So let's go to the, to the result. The first one is that the interaction between innovation and stakeholder, it exists. This is uh, a, a fact. And uh, the first point is that the project are a stimulus to create this, uh, this interaction between, uh, between stakeholders. The other is that it's need to put in place a, a series of, a, of a supporting mechanism. So the first one, and I think also more in one of the most important is the need of a homogeneous policy framework in the country that is necessary. This was uh, highlighted by many of, of the people that were interviewed and in the country and also at the regional level. We, I love, I'm mean, Italian and from the south of Italy, but uh, and I love the, all the Mediterranean uh, part of the country have been there, been there, uh, there in many, many times, but we must, to be honest with ourselves, uh, we, uh, the Mediterranean um, area is one of the most fragmented in the world. This is, it's amper the flow of know-how, it's amper the exchange between, within companies and the, from different countries. And this is, uh, one, one of the problems that must, must be solved. Uh, the other point is that is the, uh, there is the need to increase the communication capacity between research and innovation and innovator actors. We say that many times uh, we have the feature of the researcher and of the entrepreneur and that those two words doesn't speak. So create support mechanisms, so technology transfer, workshop, brokerage, like, like the one that we are uh, seen today are key to, to create this uh, flow of, uh, of know-how. The other point, uh, and I speak uh, to the research center now, uh, is that uh, it's necessary at uh, the top level of management uh, commitment. This, uh, if you look at the several studies done on the, on the open innovation field sector, we see that the commitment is key and that this commitment must came by the, by the managers, the top management. And then we need to create some entrepreneurship courses in the university. To, uh, we don't need to become all entrepreneurs, but it's more important to favor the entrepreneurship attitude within the company. So to favor the risk attitude in the, in the company because as we will see after, only companies are able to incorporate an option. And then is, uh, we need a, a best case example that uh, can be showed in order to promote uh, a good uh, university business cooperation. Other point is the lack of management in capacity to handle open innovation, lack of platform that are able to link researchers and innovators. This is again a key uh, together with the cultural aspects, such as what we said before, the uh, low entrepreneurial attitude. The attitude can be solved, uh, it's personal attitude, but uh, a good know-how can uh, entrepreneurial mindset uh, and uh, culture can be built. Which are the motivators that are the main uh, aspects that can uh, support to facing this, uh, the barriers. The first one is the appropriate training to transfer the innovation knowledge. It's important if when we are sick, we go to the doctor, if we need to solve a problem, we need specialized people. So uh, it's important to train and to create a class of uh, professional in innovation transfer. The other point is, uh, create a great uh, financing uh, process in order to stimulate innovation, to stimulate the uptake by the, the, by the company. Something that, uh, that is extremely interesting uh, when we interviewed the people is that uh, people that are uh, working technology transfer, they do because they want to have a positive impact in the society. 
So we need uh, to consider this uh, when we will set, the, uh, set up the policy to use uh, and to spread this, this uh, impact, uh, uh, this behavior as, um, as, pa as a powerful element to stimulate the innovation technology transfer. The other one is, uh, and this is something what we are doing here in Arias and Spark, uh, is to provide to the entrepreneur uh, their capacity to access to university facilities, to research organizations, to research platform, to research infrastructure, because the companies are not able to afford uh, uh, the investment. And sometimes it's not also even necessary that they afford the investment when they can um, go to the university, to the research center, and ask for support and use the know-how and the technology that is uh, present in the university. There are also some macro factors uh, that uh, can uh, influence the uh, technology transfer. Uh, as I said, uh, the first one is policy framework. When we interviewed uh, the, the more than 700 people in the questionnaire, we asked, are you aware if there are some policies in your country that support uh, innovation and technology transfer? We realized that many of the people interviewed they, did, they were not aware. So it's, uh, it's, it's important that uh, at also policy level, regional level, there are some awareness activities in order to present a more homogeneous uh, framework and promote the framework to the recipients. Because the policies at all, at all level are not be able to influence the interaction among the stakeholders. And uh, uh, and the interaction often is uh, created in a spontaneous way, uh, way. So, and it's not stimulated by the policy. So we need uh, in a, a country level, a, a sort of heuristic framework that, that can afford the problem, the barriers, and, and work on increasing the motivator factors. And they need to, to work in a heuristic way. Then, uh, which we asked uh, if there are some policies based on the quintuple Alex model, that is the model that is today adopted by also the European Com the, uh, Commission, where uh, we they want to the, stimulate regional innovation. And uh, we realized that there is not this, frame, this policy framework at a regional level, or at least it's not perceived. So those are some of the macro factors. Uh, that uh, that uh, needed to be solved. So, to go back, which are the challenges? Um, the first one is to create real synergies between uh, internal and external policies. We need to act at the policy level. Then, uh, and I know that uh, my fr dear friend uh, Mohamed maybe is not agree with me, but uh, uh, too much time is spent in the mind of the people, of the researcher to protect the intellectual property. We don't need only to protect it, only to protect the intellectual property as uh, intellectual property as patenting. Patenting is not the only way to valorize uh, uh, the research. Uh, the, the research. There are other ways. Entrepreneurship is a, a startup spin-off. I mean, startups creation, spin-off development are a way to valorize intellectual property. And I said, well, as I said also, there are some lack of specialized employed within the research center and within the industries able to create this, uh, this interaction, this flow of innovation. And finally, we have some barriers and experimental barriers that can uh, like uh, uh, not awareness, uh, not confidence uh, in, uh, in, uh, in cooperating with, uh, with others. So we can regroup those uh, into challenges. We are, can have structural barriers and psychological and aptitudinal barriers. Those barriers are um, hindering, mm -hmm. like, like a gate, the flow of information towards startups. And as I said, if we look at the open innovation model, from one side, we will have the search input. The other way, in order to have innovation are startups. 
are, the, uh, is selling the patent, is licensing the innovation, the patent. So uh, those are the way in which we are, we can, uh, we can valorize the, the, the research. And the only way, way is then is to stimulate the startup creation. And so, so we need, uh, is what is necessary is a structural approach to solve those problem and to trigger technology transfer also by leveraging private investor and to increase uh, and support the entrepreneurial attitude and nurture would be entrepreneurial. That means startups. A piece of solution, I'm not saying that this is all the solution, but a piece of solution is to create acceleration program where uh, in the water, energy, food, the nexus, because we can, as you said, we can face the climate change only tackling one of the challenges in order to valorize and exploit the research result and, uh, and uh, create this accelerator in order to orient the, the solution uh, toward to the market. Then uh, what is necessary is to create a really fee, uh, project that can support the SMEs to moving to uptake the innovation done within the university and bring them to the market. So we need as, uh, as uh, policy makers, uh, and what we are doing here, I will go back on this after, uh, is to create a technical coaching program, business coaching, a workshop where we support the startups. Just to give you now an, an example. Uh, what I'll we ask you to uh, approach uh, conclusion, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, so what we do in Arisense Park is exactly this. We work uh, in, uh, in four main areas. We are a technology transfer organization, public, and uh, we have a, a part from the campus. We have the innovation business creation and technology platform where companies from outside can come here to test within our research facilities the, their technologies, their, their, their ideas. And we bring, we support the pre incubation, incubation acceleration program for the development of high tech startup. In this case, for example, one example, one practical example could be to have regional funds or national funds that are coordinated by uh, an entity, an uh, over uh, entity, and uh, uh, that will coordinate, uh, can coordinate incubators that are working with the startup in the territory. What we have done here in the culture and creative sector was uh, to use the um, public money of the region for million a euro and we uh, are supporting uh, now 60 startup uh, that are uh, creating innovation for the market thank you very interesting approach alberto and i, I like the the uh, big thinking to be honest, I think I think we need to take up more of this type of thinking in order to move forward in a productive manner. Uh, I will invite all of the attendees uh, to uh, engage with the speakers and with us all through the question and answer or a chat. Or, uh, but I, I would like to uh, ask you a, a couple of questions here, if you don't mind, Alberto. Yeah, uh, first of all, if, if you're going to run uh, such an ambitious program, assuming that, that it can move forward, okay, and find its funding, uh, isn't there a worry that administering such a, a, a broad program can, can overwhelm the costs of implementing the program itself? Or is there an efficient way to roll out uh, such a big uh, scope? Well, uh, the... In our case, uh, what we are doing uh, uh, yeah, um, we have some in, uh, in economy, of course. 
uh, this economy of scale uh, because the program uh, is quite uh, large. But being uh, ourselves a public research entity and, and so already the financed by the taxpayer, if we have some inefficiency, we are going, we are covering with our funds. But uh, at the, uh, uh, I must be honest, nothing is perfect. Uh, uh, especially th this is the, um, one of the uh, of the program that we have, uh, and of course there are difficulties. But of, uh, but uh, what is important that is a way, and according to us, an efficient way. First of all, to coordinate all the uh, the actors, uh, the incubator, the business support organization that are working in the territory. And the second one is a way to stimulate innovation in the territory and, and create companies. I see. Thank you so much. This is this is a very interesting uh, outlook, and uh, I have to agree with uh, with you on many. Of course, you know I am not a fan of harmonization of policy or of harmonization of uh, regulations. Uh, I think until you have a unified economic area, which is very far for the Med right now, uh, we are one market by virtue of being together in the same place, but this isn't one market by virtue of uh, freedom of movement of capital or people. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I, I, I always have a caveat when, I'm, when we're talking about harmonization of policies or laws or yeah, anything yeah. like that. But uh, of course, we're all at least, we can all agree that we are harmonized in needing the policies and in needing. <laughs> this is not a surprise. Okay, this is not a surprise. Thank you so much, Alberto. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Uh, you can, I think, stop sharing your uh, screen right now. Yes. Uh, now I, I have to, uh, of course, admit that uh, my French is as good as my Sensecrete, which is very, very, very poor. Uh, so. I, I will always have a limited communication capacity if comments or uh, questions are put to me in uh, French. However, I, I am uh, very proud uh, to present our next speaker. It is, it is not often that you have in a technology transfer uh, session uh, a speaker that can uh, see research and research administration, research funding from such a uh, high level, such a top-down uh, perspective. Uh, Professor Shadli Abdali uh, is our next speaker. He is the uh, the general manager of the National Agency for Scientific Research Promotion. Uh, such a sensitive and important position shows the uh, gained uh, momentum behind technology transfer. And I am really interested to hear uh, Professor uh, Shadli Abdali's presentation, uh, tools implemented by the ANPR for better opening of research and socioeconomic environment through its projects. Uh, Professor Shadli, it gives me great pleasure to give you the floor. Uh, you can unmute and uh, let's hope that uh, we hear you. Professor Shadley, can you hear me? Professor Shadley? Okay, we, we, we can see your presentation, but we are yet to hear you. So can you unmute, please? Unmute, please, Professor Shadley. Can you hear me, Professor Shadley? Yes, can you hear me? Can you hear me, Professor Shadley? Professor Shadley, can you hear me? Uh, excuse excuse uh, me. Uh, Professor Shadley, can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Professor oh. Shadley, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Uh, just one minute. Just one minute. I, I can hear you. Very good. Very good. So please, at your leisure, you can start your presentation. Okay. Okay. I will share my presentation. Sure. We can see it now. We yeah. can see a presentation entitled okay. Technology okay. Transfer Tools at the National Agency for Scientific Research Promotion. Okay. We so I, I think we can see your presentation. 
يجيني الحكايه هذه تو كيفاش باش تكسو اه بروفيسور نحن نشوف البرزنتيشن لحظه 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 انا ما نشوفش البرزنتيشن اه ايش هذه سكر وعاود من جديد عاود سكر 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 كله عاود من جديد ممكن تعمل شير للديسكتوب كامل م- موش للبرزنتيشن لوحده وبهاي الطريقه نحن نشوفها وانت تشوفها ان شاء الله ها I have to give you some unfortunate news. Well, oh, had il, uh, uh, I have to give you some unfortunate news while we're waiting for uh, uh, the presentation to be prepared. Unfortunately, one of one of uh, uh, the speakers uh, from Tunis, uh, another one of the speakers from Tunis, Skaltoum uh, Makhlouf, unfortunately had to uh, cancel her commitment with us due to an emerging. Uh, Uh, situation and uh, we are, we're going to be missing her presentation but uh, of course we will uh, allow professor shadley slightly more time in order to capitalize on his presence with us and in order to uh, you know utilize our time together in the best way so professor shadley are you ready now uh, Professor Shadley, should we uh, change the order of presentations? How about that? Uh, out of interest, Muhammad Adiab. Uh, here we go. Yes, doctor. Uh, just uh, get yourself ready. Maybe we need to do a okay. shuffle. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Munder, I'll make sure that you finish by 3.30, don't worry. Your presentation is supposed to finish actually at 3.20, and I think we we'll, uh, might uh, need a few extra moments, but not too many. So, Professor Shedley, can you hear me? Can you start? Professor Shadley? No? Okay. Um, can I request that uh, our colleagues at uh, the, uh, here we go again. Professor Shadley, can you hear me? Uh, I think he left the meeting. So, Muhammad Diab, are you ready? Yes, doctor, I'm ready. Okay. Uh, can I request that our colleagues uh, at the organizers give uh, Professor Shadley a quick phone call to inform him that he's going to have uh, about 15 or 20 minutes extra in order to prepare himself? Uh, unless he suddenly appears now. Professor Shadley, can you hear me? تسمعني بروفيسور؟ بروفيسور احنا نشوف وانت تشوف اعتقد تمام صحيح؟ اسكو فو ديزولي اسكو مي كوتي دونك نسمعك نسمعك تفضل okay. تفضل بروفيسور اوكي 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 اكسكيوز مي اكسكيوز مي فور ذيس بروبليم بور باسي دون ديابو اون اوتر تفضل بروفيسور اوكي اوكي الساعه 3 و35 دقيقه فنحن شوي متاخرين عن المعذره المعذره توت ميز لكن نعطيك 20 دقيقه تفضل 
فيه فيه زميله هي مش تكون معنا دونك كانت مش تحكي دونك لازم ناخذ منها شويه وقت ما دام كلفتنا نعم يعني ما ان شاء الله 20 دقيقه كامله بعد اذنك ان شاء الله ان شاء الله ان شاء الله بروفيسور ثانك يو فيري ماتش فور ذيس اوبورتونيتي اي ويل سبيك اند بريزنت سام تولز for technology transfer implemented by the National Agency for Scientific Research Promotion. Uh, excuse me, I will speak in French. And uh, uh, maintenant, the transfer technology, comme vous l'avez dit, uh, suscite uh, l'intérêt grandissant de la communauté scientifique et des partenaires socio-économiques, et uh, pour plusieurs raisons d'ailleurs. Et uh, si nous regardons un peu, l'indice global de l'innovation et si nous regardons le classement de la Tunisie en termes de production scientifique, nous sommes la Tunisie classée 18e sur 131 pays en termes de production scientifique. Donc nous sommes très bien classés euh, en ce qui concerne la production scientifique. Mais si nous regardons un peu la collaboration dans le domaine de la recherche entre les universités et les entreprises, nous sommes classés 103 sur 131. Donc, l'écart est très important. On fait une recherche d'excellente qualité, mais cette recherche n'a pas jusqu'à maintenant un impact significatif sur euh, le développement économique. Euh, si nous regardons notre paramètre, l'absorption du savoir par les entreprises, nous sommes classés 113e sur 131. Donc, nos entreprises ne sont pas capables jusqu'à présent euh, d'absorber les acquis de la recherche et l'innovation euh, de manière générale. C'est pour cette raison que le ministère de l'Enseignement supérieur de la recherche scientifique il a développé toute une stratégie pour le, le transfert de technologies. Et à l'Ampère, nous développons plusieurs dispositifs. Je vais présenter ces dispositifs de manière brève. Le premier, c'est le Mobidoc. C'est la mobilité des docteurs ou bien des doctorants vers le milieu socio-économique pour y conduire une recherche appliquée qui répond parfaitement aux besoins de ses partenaires socio-économiques. Donc, ce, ce dispositif, en quelque sorte, si vous voulez, il met la recherche, il met le savoir-faire à la disposition des partenaires socio-économiques. C'est un moyen pour rapprocher la recherche du milieu socio-économique. Il a pour objectif de favoriser une recherche collaborative qui est orientée totalement vers les besoins du milieu socio-économique. Elle, elle permet de promouvoir l'innovation et le transfert de technologie et ça permet aussi d'améliorer l'employabilité des jeunes, surtout des jeunes docteurs et doctorants. Et ce dispositif, si vous voulez, donc, il a vu le jour en 2012. Donc, il a été financé par la délégation de l'Union européenne dans le cadre du projet, projet Passeri, puis dans le cadre du projet Emory. Et nous avons financé jusqu'à maintenant 500 projets, 500 projets pour 350 partenaires socio-économiques et 100, 150 structures de recherche. Si nous regardons un peu la distribution des projets par les selon le secteur économique, nous voyons que nous avons touché plusieurs secteurs, donc l'agroalimentaire, la chimie, l'électricité, l'énergie, etc. Et si nous regardons un peu des gouvernorats, nous avons touché pratiquement toutes les régions du pays. Nous avons touché 20 gouvernorats du nord au sud. Et si nous regardons un peu la distribution selon les partenaires ou bien le type d'activité des partenaires socio-économiques, nous voyons que surtout les entreprises privées, donc qui occupent 66 de l'ensemble des organismes bénéficiaires. Donc, il y a une belle adhésion des, des entreprises dans ce processus ou bien d'être dans, dans l'accueil de nos chercheurs, de nos jeunes chercheurs pour ce, ce type de mobilité. Euh, donc, depuis 2019, le ministère nous a aussi euh, soutenus financièrement pour donc, euh, financer des, euh, des mobilités de jeunes doctorants. Donc, il y a environ 40 euh, doctorants qui, dans plusieurs secteurs, donc la biotechnologie, la chimie, l'environnement, etc. Et nous, ils nous ont aussi, dans le cadre de ce projet de modernisation de l'enseignement supérieur en soutien à l'employabilité, donc ils nous ont financé pratiquement 140. Donc, au total, jusqu'à maintenant, 
nous avons soutenu 700 projets Mobidoc, 700, euh, 700 projets. Et si on veut voir un peu les outputs de ce, ce dispositif, nous voyons donc surtout pour l'édition qui est achevée, nous, nous voyons qu'il y a des brevets dé, déposés. Euh, généralement, lorsqu'on dit recherche appliquée, des fois on dit qu'il n'y a pas une production scientifique. Non, ce n'est pas vrai, parce qu'il s'agit d'une recherche appliquée, mais une recherche d'excellence, parce qu'elle a permis de publier 347 articles dans des revues impactées. Ces projets mobile doc de jeunes chercheurs constituent un moyen pour développer de nouveaux projets, soit des projets nationaux ou même des projets internationaux. Ça permet aussi de créer des start-up et ça permet aussi de créer de l'emploi pour nos jeunes chercheurs et nos dispositifs, notre dispositif, donc il a eu plusieurs prix à l'échelle nationale et internationale. Dernièrement, nous avons, si vous voulez, on est conscient que ce transfert de technologie nécessite des profils bien déterminés, de, nouvelles, de nouveaux métiers pour le transfert de technologie. C'est pour cela que nous avons recruté des docteurs et ces docteurs ont été formés au niveau, au niveau de notre agence et dans le cadre du projet Emory par l'unité de gestion du programme Agenda. Et ces docteurs sont affectés dans les technopoles pour assister les technopoles, pour améliorer leur expertise dans la levée de fonds et surtout pour améliorer l'interaction entre la technopole et le, leur région. Et nous allons faire de même donc pour les universités. Donc nous, ont, euh, nous allons affecter des docteurs qui ont une nouvelle expertise pour faciliter le transfert de technologie entre les universités et leur milieu. Euh, très prochainement, donc, euh, nous avons aussi le projet Soifi. Nous allons recruter environ 270 docteurs. Et nous nous préparons pour une session en Mobidoc Environnement. Ce sont des docteurs qui vont résoudre des problèmes environnementaux et qui seront affectés dans les, euh, les municipalités. Euh, un, un autre mécanisme que nous avons mis en place, c'est les bureaux de transfert de, de technologie. Et euh, donc, l'AMPR, elle supervise 25 bureaux de transfert de technologie localisés dans les universités et les centres de recherche. Et nous avons des conventions euh, annuelles donc, pour ces activités. Donc, c'est qu -ce euh, juste pour vous dire un peu ce qu'on appelle les référents buts. Donc, dans ces buts, il y a, nous avons 25 bureaux, euh, 25 bureaux de transfert de technologie et nous avons environ 70 référents buts. En moyenne, nous avons deux à trois personnes par bureau de transfert de technologie et avec des différents profils, des ingénieurs, des enseignants, des juristes, et des spécialistes en communication, V, etc. Et quelles, quelles sont les, les, les missions de ces bureaux de transfert de technologie C'est d'abord améliorer la visibilité des chercheurs et des structures de recherche euh, à travers la mise en place par les universités, des centres de recherche, d'annuaires et des brochures. C'est améliorer l'interaction entre les universités, les centres de recherche et leur milieu via l'organisation des journées portes ouvertes, via l'organisation des journées recherche et innovation et aussi l'organisation des compétitions, notamment pour la création de start-up, de spin-off. Il y a aussi un axe de formation, c'est des journées de formation spécifiques dans le montage de projets, la rédaction de brevets, la recherche d'entreprise, la création d'entreprises et les mécanismes de financement. C'est aussi l'accompagnement des structures de recherche et pour fournir le conseil et l'orientation en termes de, de projets et de, euh, si vous voulez, de contractualisation entre les structures de recherche et le milieu socio-économique. Donc, nous, ces bureaux de transfert de technologie, nous avons mis en place ce qu'on appelle un peu l'espace Butnet, ou bien c'est une plateforme. Dans cette plateforme, donc, ça permet de par le partage des activités entre les 25 bureaux, mais ça fournit pas mal de documents ou bien de utiles, par exemple, des fiches pour la déclaration d'invention pour les porteurs de nouveaux résultats, des fiches d'experts pour les chercheurs ayant des projets innovants, des fiches d'identification du besoin pour les entreprises et des fiches d'offres technologiques pour les laboratoires souhaitant pouvoir promouvoir leur, leur expertise. Donc, si vous voulez, c'est pour, pour, pour promouvoir le matching, l'interaction entre l'offre et le besoin technologique. Euh, donc, j'ai parlé des formations qu'on est en train d'assurer dans les bureaux de transfert de technologie. C'est juste... Euh, de manière brève, sont des formations, par exemple, dans les méthodologies de recensement 
des ressources et compétences valorisables des structures de recherche et leur marketing. C'est également des formations dans l'intelligence économique et la veille au service de la recherche et l'innovation. Donc, nous, nous assurons ces formations avec des experts au niveau de notre agence, mais des experts internationaux. Aussi, donc, la mise en place de stratégies pour la promotion du développement et la richesse régionale en vue de la création d'emplois. Également, donc, euh, approfondir les connaissances en propriété intellectuelle, échanger les bonnes pratiques des, de la valorisation des résultats de la recherche et faire de l'innovation un levier majeur d'épanouissement économique. On fait ça surtout avec euh, des établissements euh, internationaux, mais c'est juste pour échanger, comme je l'ai dit, de bonnes pratiques. Euh, nous faisons aussi des, des séances, si vous voulez, de sensibilisation aux différentes universités en début d'année, surtout pour les jeunes chercheurs, pour leur parler de ces nouvelles, ce nouveau concept de transfert technologie, la valorisation des résultats de la recherche, etc. Euh, et dernièrement, dernièrement donc, euh, l'AMPR euh, elle va renforcer son expertise via euh, son application dans des projets internationaux. Le premier projet, c'est le pepi formed c'est euh, donc le marché public de l'innovation. Donc, il implique quatre pays. Donc, si vous voulez, c'est quoi l'objectif Nous savons que le secteur public, normalement, c'est le grand acheteur, si vous voulez, de l'innovation. Mais les centres de recherche et les structures de recherche, ils produisent des résultats qui ne sont pas mûrs du point de vue technolo donc technologiquement. C'est pour cela qu'on associe les centres de recherche et des entreprises, des, des start-up qui contribuent ensemble pour améliorer la, la maturité des technologies et les mettre à la disposition du secteur public. Nous avons aussi un autre projet, c'est le projet Intecmed, c'est les incubateurs d'innovation de transfert technologie en Méditerranée. Je passe rapidement, c'est aussi un projet de transfert technologie de création de start-up. Euh, dans ce projet, euh, puisqu'on est deux partenaires en Tunisie, l'Agence la, 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 nationale de la promotion de la recherche, mais également la Chambre de commerce et d'industrie du Gabon, nous avons mis en place une alliance régionale pour le transfert de l'innovation. Nous avons conçu un programme d'incubation et nous sommes en train de, si vous voulez, de mettre en œuvre ce programme. Et l'objectif, c'est de sélectionner 12 start-up nationales pour être accompagnées. Et par la suite, donc, il y aura trois projets qui auront, internationaux qui seront, si vous voulez, donc, qui auront des, des prix. Euh, donc, c'est juste nous avons, pour dire que nous avons lancé déjà l'appel le 15 décembre. Voici donc, euh, il suffit de rentrer dans le site de l'AMPR, à npr.tn. Et euh, nous avons différentes adresses. Voilà, voici nos contacts. Euh, S'il y a des questions, parce que l'appel se poursuit jusqu'à la fin du janvier, 31 janvier 2022. Donc, euh, j'ai dit qu'on va sélectionner dans une première étape 12 porteurs de projets, 12 projets. Ces 12 projets, nous allons les mettre dans un espace euh, de coworking qui est bien équipé. Euh, donc, il y aura une formation basique au niveau des, des aspects juridiques, financiers. Mais il y a aussi, surtout, un encadrement individuel qui devrait conduire à, pour chacun de mettre en place son plan d'affaires. Et par la suite, donc, sur les 12, on va financer trois start-up. Donc, l'Ampère, donc, euh, elle a aussi donc, une belle expertise dans la création de spin-off. Nous avons réalisé ça dans le cadre du projet de modernisation de l'enseignement supérieur en soutien à l'employabilité. C'est un appel qui est destiné aux jeunes diplômés, ingénieurs, titulaires de master, jeunes chercheurs inscrits en thèse, docteurs en doctorat ou bien des post-docs. Et euh, donc, jusqu'à maintenant, nous avons, si vous voulez, soutenu et accompagné 12, euh, pardon, 20 spin-offs. Spin Actuellement, nous sommes en train aussi de promouvoir un nouveau concept, la smart specialization ou bien la spécialisation intelligente, qui c'est un concept très important pour le développement régional. Et vous savez que ce concept, il a vu le jour en Europe. Et c'est en quelque sorte à travers un processus interactif entre les structures de recherche, entre la société civile, les entreprises et les structures administratives financières. Tout ce monde se met dans le, dans le cadre d'un processus interactif. Pourquoi faire Pour voir quelle est l'action qui tient compte des, des points forts 
de chaque région. C'est pour promouvoir des projets qui vont assurer le développement, si vous voulez, de ces régions. Donc, et vous savez que cette euh, approche de, de Smart Specialization, c'est pour la première fois qu'elle rentre, si vous voulez, en Afrique. Et la Tunisie constitue un pilote précurseur en Afrique et d'ailleurs dans le monde arabe. Et nous avons, si vous voulez, euh, travaillé dans, dans ce cadre, avec des, dans le cadre du projet Passeri, mais aussi dans le cadre du programme du, des pays Dialogue 5 plus 5, mais aussi avec le projet IRADA. Et déjà, nous avons travaillé dans trois régions de la Tunisie et nous avons identifié des projets prometteurs dans ces différentes régions. Euh, J'ai pratiquement terminé. C'est pour dire que le transfert technologie, c'est très important, mais pour réussir ce transfert technologie, il faut promouvoir les nouveaux métiers d'appui à la recherche et au transfert technologie. Il faut d'abord identifier les nouveaux métiers en termes de veille, ingénierie de projet, ingénierie de valorisation de, de la recherche, management de l'innovation, de marketing de l'innovation, le transfert de technologie, le marketing des résultats de la recherche, la communication et surtout la vulgarisation scientifique qui a un impact euh, très important sur la valorisation. Il faut aussi mettre en place une académie pour les nouveaux métiers d'appui à la recherche et l'innovation, pour la professionnalisation de ce corps de métier. Euh, il il s'agit de former, d'assurer une formation complémentaire pour les compétences déjà existantes, ou bien de mettre en place un parcours académique orienté vers ces métiers émergents, ou bien élaborer les programmes appropriés de formation. Il est important aussi d'institualiser les nouveaux métiers en vue d'assurer leur pérennité. Il faut une pérennité à ces métiers. Et ceci à travers la mise en valeur de ces nouvelles, nouvelles compétences par la création des structures d'interfaçage dans les universités, les centres de recherche, les technopoles, etc. Il, il faut aussi mettre en place des textes législatifs et réglementaires appropriés et un statut dynamique de progression des carrières avec des incitations. Il faut reconnaître aussi ces nouveaux ou bien ces activités liées aux nouveaux métiers dans les parcours académiques et ou dans l'évolution des carrières professionnelles. Voilà, donc, euh, j'ai terminé. Merci pour votre attention. Thank you so much, Professor, uh, for this extensive and uh, very quick presentation. You covered a lot of ground very quickly. Huh? And I have to say that having worked with so many technology transfer offices in Tunisia, the uh, centralized system I think it, it appears to be working well. Yes. And I, th I think that uh, we are looking forward to seeing some very interesting uh, technology transfer happening in Tunisia over the coming years. So congratulations uh, on, on the, this presentation and uh, congratulations to Tunis for uh, building what is potentially a very effective and uh, very impactful technology transfer uh, system. Um, by the way, uh, the other speakers as well, you can pose a question if, if any of the speakers, we, do, we don't have a question uh, online, but uh, if any of the speakers would like to uh, present a question or, uh, or a comment, then feel free to do so. Uh, in order to pull us back onto schedule, I will request that uh, the uh, subsequent presentations are limited to instead of 20 minutes including question and answer let's say 17 minutes maximum including question and answer okay thank you professor thank you so much so thank you uh, for our next speaker this is a, a speaker that i have a particular uh, privilege and uh, joy in presenting um, Hamad Diab Uh, is uh, famous across the region for a few reasons. He's one of the very few people who actually can take a full-on technology disclosure in whatever, uh, almost <laughs> any field whatsoever and magically turn it into a patent that will get accepted and hopefully also licensed out. Uh, Muhammad, of course, uh, is a WIPO expert and an expert for within a number of uh, a European uh, Union and USAID funded projects. He is uh, the intellectual property and clients manager at the intellectual property commercialization office within the Royal Scientific Society, which gives me the great pleasure of being his boss. Okay, so no pressure. 
Muhammad, of course, you can, uh, <laughs> okay. you can share your screen and give us your presentation on water energy, food technology protection and technology readiness uh, through your uh, hands-on and uh, uh, real experience in technology protection and technology commercialization. Please, Muhammad, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Muhammad, for your introduction. And please, uh, first of all, allow me to thank CCIC for giving me this opportunity uh, to participate in this uh, Innovation Week and more particularly in this interesting workshop. Okay, uh, so when we talk about, intellect, uh, about uh, technology protection, we refer to the intellectual property protection. Uh, the World Intellectual Property Organization defines intellectual property as the creations of the mind uh, that have value in commerce. So generally speaking, uh, abstract ideas or abstract thoughts don't have commercial values, therefore they cannot be regarded as intellectual property. Uh, protecting intellectual property means obtaining intellectual property rights. Therefore, uh, IP rights are rights granted by a government to the owner giving him some uh, exclusive rights to utilize the protected technology or protected IP. Uh, if you are going to classify intellectual property rights, uh, they are generally classified into two uh, major classes, which are copyrights and industrial property. Uh, copyrights protect the content of literally and artistic works such as novels, poems, paintings, and computer software. Uh, the main characteristic of uh, copyrights is that uh, they provide uh, global protection and provide a long term of protection compared to others, uh, other intellectual property rights. So regarding industrial property. Uh, industrial property includes patents, utility models, industrial designs, trade secrets, trademarks, and other intellectual property rights, such as uh, geographical indications, plant varieties, and so on. Let's talk about trade secrets. Trade secrets refer to confidential information that gives a, a company a competitive advantage. Uh, the protection of trade secrets can be achieved by taking measures that, con that maintain the confidentiality of uh, this information, uh, such as signing confidentiality agreements with third parties, adopting strict confidentiality policies, restricting the access to this information uh, to certain staff, etc. Uh, the protection is uh, there is no uh, legal, uh, direct legal protection. So it's, uh, trade secrets are protected by uh, remaining or, keep, or keeping uh, the information secret. Uh, regarding trademarks, trademarks are distinct, distinctive signs that distinguish uh, goods and services of a company from uh, the goods and services of other companies. Uh, these distinctive signs could be logos, names, colors, sounds, and in some countries, uh, orders can be protected as uh, trademarks. Uh, industrial designs and industrial models, uh, they protect the aesthetic or outer shape of products. As such, they don't um, protect or give protection to, um, let's say, functional aspects of uh, technologies. They only protect the uh, outer shape that's uh, visible to uh, the, um, the public. Um, about utility models, uh, utility models are sometimes referred to as uh, petty patents. Uh, this kind of protection is not available in all uh, countries. However, they protect what we call minor inventions uh, in a similar system to the patent system. Uh, the term of protection of utility models is uh, generally ranging between six and 10 years. Uh, so it's um, relatively speaking, it's a um, um, short term of protection compared to other um, uh, industrial property rights or intellectual property rights. Um, patents protect the functional aspects of uh, inventions. Uh, a patent is a certificate that's granted by a government to the patent owner, giving him the exclusive right of utilizing the invention and uh, preventing others from uh, utilizing this uh, invention uh, without uh, his prior consent. Uh, and the term of protection uh, for patents is uh, 20 years. 
So uh, utility models and patents uh, protect inventions. Uh, an invention could be defined as, as you can see here, um, it's a product or process that provides in general a new way of doing something or offers a new uh, technical solution to a problem. So um, the invention can be uh, a product, a process, a system. When we um, say product, it can be a device, an apparatus, a tool, uh, or a system, or, uh, or a method or process of manufacturing. So uh, reflecting what have been uh, said on um, regarding intellectual property rights on uh, web technologies, I believe that the majority of uh, web technologies are products and uh, methods. Uh, therefore, innovation, innovators can uh, seek prote protection for patents and utility models uh, such that they can protect their technologies, the functional aspect of the technologies, um, in addition to trademarks to protect the brands, uh, industrial designs to protect uh, the shapes and designs of their products, and copyrights to protect uh, system catalogs and manuals. So uh, the question is that, why it's important to protect WEF technologies in general? Uh, the answer can be summarized into uh, three main points. The first one is that uh, intellectual property rights facilitate building partnerships. Uh, protection of technologies gives um, these technologies increased uh, values and increased value means better commercialization revenues. When talking about commercializing certain technology, some factors may influence the entire process in addition to uh, influencing the, um, let's say the, uh, the commercialization pathway. Uh, these factors may include technology readiness level, commercial readiness level, system or integration readiness level, and manufacturing readiness level, among others. Uh, I will not go in, into details in, um, into these levels, uh, but I will talk a little bit about the first one, which is uh, technology readiness level. As you can see here, um, technology readiness levels is a scale uh, containing nine readiness levels from uh, TRL1 uh, at the bottom uh, to TRL9. It's originally developed by uh, NASA, the, um, the Aerospace and Aeronautics Association. Uh, this scale is used to estimate the technology maturity. Uh, as I said, um, TRL1 is the lowest and TRL9 is the uh, highest. Uh, in general, when a technology is still in the research phase, it's usually within the range of uh, TRL1 to TRL3. Uh, technology readiness levels four, four to uh, six, four, five, and six refer to the development phase of uh, the technology. Uh, seven to nine uh, refer to the deployment uh, phase. Uh, in general, uh, patents may start to formulate at uh, technology readiness levels two and three. Uh, for the funding of uh, technologies in the uh, technology readiness level, um, the funding for technology readiness levels one to four is usually obtained from universities and governments. Uh, funding for uh, technologies uh, in uh, technology readiness level seven to nine usually comes from uh, the private sector. Uh, the value of death for technology uh, may be in uh, technology readiness levels five and six, as there is no uh, academia funding at uh, this stage and no uh, business uh, funding. So as you can see here in the um, let's say it, uh, graph, uh, as the technology uh, readiness um, advances, uh, the value of uh, the technology increases. And as the value increases, the risk is being mitigated and decreased. As, the, as, uh, the, uh, as this risk uh, is dropped, uh, partners usually become uh, more accessible. But um, the longer you hang on the technology, the more accumulated risk you will bear. So uh, it's important to, uh, to try and um, find a partner uh, at uh, early uh, technology readiness levels. Okay, I said this. 
Okay. As I mentioned earlier, protection te uh, protecting technologies attracts and facilitates partnerships, uh, but finding a partner or a licensee may be difficult and needs time. This time uh, may be dependent upon uh, maybe the technology readiness level, uh, competent uh, technology or com competing technologies, uh, availability of protection and the market size. The earlier the technology is uh, in the technology readiness level, uh, the longer it takes to find a licensee. But uh, the licensee has to be chosen based on its ability to uh, commercialize the technology. Okay. Uh, so after finding a partner or a licensee, it's important to negotiate the following issues with him. Uh, the first one is the scope of uh, the licensing agreement, uh, licensees' obligations uh, regarding the devotion to the technology owner, uh, who pays the protection costs, and uh, the monitoring of uh, technology infringement, and who will bear the litigation expenses. Uh, in my opinion, it's better to, to ask the uh, licensee always to, uh, to pay uh, for the protection and the IP costs and uh, in case of infringement uh, to uh, bear the uh, litigation expenses and costs. Uh, in general, any licensing contract should include the following um, details. The scope of the license technology uh, the type of license, whether it's exclusive or non-exclusive, uh, the territory of the licensing contract and the remuneration um, regarding the financial compensation. Is it uh, royalties, lump sum, or uh, a combination of both? And when the uh, remuneration is to be paid, as well as the uh, time frame of the licensing contract. So uh, that's all for my presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please go ahead. Thank you. Again, I will invite uh, the speakers as well to pose their questions if they have uh, any. Uh, I have a question for you since we have a couple of minutes extra. Yeah, don't relax too much. This is this okay. is your manager speaking. So, um, when we're looking at uh, innovation or entrepreneurial endeavors within the water, energy, food nexus area. What, what we are looking at really is people trying to capture the efficiencies that show up naturally when you treat uh, water and energy as one problem, not as two separate problems. Yes. So when water is a problem and energy is a problem, you can only treat them separately. When you combine them together, you combine them with food, you combine them with the, with the other, uh, with the other, uh, you know, uh, approaches that are that are within the WEF nexus, it 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 comes up with additional efficiencies that make this endeavor more efficient, more impactful, more profitable, and this is what we like to see, you know, and from mm -hmm. our perspective. Now, because of this, the solutions that are on the table are normally you know, they're complex. They're, they're not complex as in difficult to see, but complex as in it's not just one thing. So, for example, okay, well, the things that we see often are something like multiple sensors, okay, within a farming system uh, with a lot of functionality uh, uh, alongside some kind of artificial intelligence and the mobile application that can also predict the price of vegetables and how much you're going to make or whatever so when it when it's this kind of setting okay this this kind of holistic or multi-faceted the solution what do you do to analyze the technology what kind of protection can be available okay um in this case uh first of all i should uh, understand what the invention is and what where is the invention uh, the inventive concept so um, while um, at the same time, uh, to bear in mind that one patent only protects one inventive concept. So uh, complex systems with a, a plurality of interactions between components and a multitude of inventive concepts, then we can uh, protect each or file a single patent application for each inventive concept. 
Um, so um, that's it. Uh, the, the, usually uh, speaking or, or uh, generally speaking, uh, patents are the uh, most preferred um, uh, pathways of uh, intellectual property protection for such kind of technologies. For the application? Not for the uh, mobile app itself, but for the entire system. So what do you do with the app? The app is not um, a, a, a separate part of the system. Uh, we can say in the patent application that the, uh, the app is a uh, interface or um, something like that. Um, for, for the, uh, let's say the, uh, the, the app itself individually, uh, we can protect the, uh, the, um, the interface and the uh, graphics of the, um, the app as industrial designs. Um, generally speaking, again, uh, copyrights are the um, uh, type of intellectual property rights for uh, applications, but uh, I don't prefer to, to, to protect uh, the, uh, the application, the source code as a copyright. Uh, this is since um, protection of copyright means that you are publishing the um, the, uh, the the source code. code. Yeah. Yes, so okay. some kind of digital rights management and um, uh, could could um, let's say protect the uh, the intellectual property. So this I suppose takes me back to Alberto's comment that uh, you really need to ask an expert when it comes to commercialization, technology transfer, and intellectual property. And yes. here, Mohammed Diab is a is a good expert and i know that uh, we give uh, uh, instruction to all of our employees that anybody asks a question you answer them so here you have a uh, potential also all the participants and all the <laughs> attendees you have potential for free uh, consulting uh, moving forward uh, alas we we had to thank you muhammad Diab. you can stop sharing now we head to our very good friend mundar Hanfir. And uh, Munder, as promised, I'll have you out of here before three o'clock. Uh, yeah. Yes. So three thirty. Three thirty. Uh, it's fine. Three thirty, of course. So Munder is a board member at uh, AMA at uh, Station F, co-founder, vice president at uh, Tunisia Africa Business Council, head of the think tank for shared prosperity in Africa governance expert to the Europe uh, to to the Council of Europe policy advisor innovation expert and author and I think now we are at approximately the second anniversary of the last time that we were together unfortunately uh, I would all, always like to meet uh, more often with you and uh, you were there at the beginning of FEMA. Can you add, uh, I remember you were involved also when we were talking about uh, Next Labs. And I hope that we will always have you near us, advising us on these projects and participating actively with them moving to the future. Munder, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. And uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, to the audience. It's uh, a true pleasure to share with you some insights about uh, web technology assessment. Uh, even though the title see, looks very uh, simple like that, but uh, it, it contains a lot of complexity and I will try to dissecate all uh, the components of technology assessment uh, through, uh, in fact, a perspective of market perspective, let's say, if I can say. So value proposition and market perspective, uh, what it is about. First of all, uh, I would like to thank Alberto Sorazzi, uh, Professor Shedi Abdeli, and Mohamed Dieb uh, for, for preparing the floor for my presentation. Because when we start uh, assessing technology, we need to know all what the, the, these guys uh, were saying. And uh, from my side, I can add the following. Technology transfer is not uh, one process. It could take different uh, uh, models. It could be adoption, adaptation, diffusion, and substitution. And with one technology, and maybe this is the complexity, you can build up a lot of IPs. So one technology in one uh, context, uh, targeting one segment in the marketplace could be 
uh, an invention and could be protected as it as an invention, as a process or as a product or whatever. But the most important thing to know, and in, here I would like to come back to what uh, Alberto said, uh, to transfer results, uh, research results to the market, we have different, let's say, ways or different modes. Uh, everyone knows about the, the collaborative research projects. Uh, this is what uh, La NPR in Tunisia is doing, or transferring competencies and know-how, or the research-based spin-off. In fact, the IP-based startups. And I will focus on, on the research-based spin-off, which is uh, my favorite, uh, and maybe the most promising one in our region, because as in the South Mediterranean, uh, we, are, we have a lackage of the industry. Uh, the main uh, way uh, to transfer knowledge is to, to transfer the knowledge, the IP, and to create the business model that will implement it. And uh, from that perspective, we have to think about the technology push, uh, which is uh, the role of the public sector, let's say, if I can say, or at least the public research uh, and development uh, labs, and uh, from, from these labs, we can uh, imagine uh, uh, the proliferation of uh, RBSO. And the proliferation of RBSO, uh, maybe before saying uh, uh, how they will pro proliferate, the uh, definition of an RBSO, uh, according to the OECD, the research-based spin-off is in fact the startup or a startup company that has at least one of these features. The founder is a public sector employee, or the co-founders are public sector employees, at least one. The key technology is licensed from public sector, and the founder, uh, or in the capital of the, 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 the startup, we should have at least uh, some representative of the, of the lab, of the, or, or the university, of the public sector. It, could be also physically located in the public sector incubator or science park and equity investments or grants uh, should be made by public sector, at least at the early beginning. So th this is the definition of the OECD. And uh, uh, these uh, RBSO could exploit uh, research result better than uh, other forms of uh, collaboration, as we have the risk takers who are uh, usually uh, managed by uh, uh, the inventors or the researchers, they could really develop something uh, by breakthrough, breakthrough invention and implement it uh, with the good connection between the market and the labs. And this experience, I have the chance to uh, have been working on it through uh, a specific uh, incubation program or uh, RBSO generation, generator in Tunisia from 2013 to 2017. And uh, I was uh, really amazed by the, the impact of this kind of programs when we do it, uh, of course, in partnership with the public sector. So. Uh, the, the Professor Shedley could uh, come back to this maybe later. Um, to, to succeed in doing this uh, spin-off process, uh, we have to uh, oversee the commercializa commercialization cycle, which includes, of course, uh, uh, different stages or tiers. We have, of course, the R&D, which is uh, uh, the inception or the opportunity identification uh, stage. And then when we are uh, certain that uh, there is uh, uh, an opportunity that could be addressed by, the, by this, uh, by an invention or an IP, we, we, need, we need to raise some funds. And usually this is the precede or angels or friends, family and fools, uh, if you like. Uh, stage. And if it works and we have a promising prototype, we can go to the seed funding, which is the third stage, or oh, so, 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 sorry, second uh, tier, second stage. 
And uh, with the seed funding, we should test the market. And from this testing, we can go, if it is successful, to the VC round. And from the VC round, you can imagine the expansion and uh, private equity funding, et cetera. So this is just to give you an idea about how it could be, uh, technology could be uh, commercialized uh, in, by different stages uh, through RBSO. But behind that, uh, of course, life is not uh, a long uh, river, uh, quite river, uh, as uh, we say in French, in long fleuve tranquille. We are very far from this uh, uh, quietness. We have to imagine that at the early beginning, when we identify the idea or the opportunity of uh, an IP uh, or a technology transfer process, we are at the, the level uh, here, we are at the point zero with the higher risk. We are at the, the, the risk 100%, let's say, if you consider that it's the higher, higher level of risk. And more we invest, and this is the investment in time, in effort, in also in money. And we are supposed to, while investing, and this is the curve of financing the, the research and the commercialization cycle, so we are supposed to have a decline of the risk. Of course, somewhere the risk, some new risk appears. And when this risk appears, we can have this kind of you know, shape. But if we invest more and there is a true market potential, the risk will, will lower until a certain level, not to zero, never to zero. But we can imagine that there is a symptome, uh, an asymptote, what you call a asymptote curve, and the risk will be acceptable uh, at an acceptable level for any investor. So you see, more you invest, if more you invest, you reduce the risk. Uh, you, you have the miracle of the this what I call the IP value stream. You have an increase of the IP and. Finally, for an, RB, an RBSO, an IP-based startup, the valuation is based on its uh, IP. So more you have uh, a, high, a higher IP valuation and uh, of course, uh, easier you will get funding. So this is roughly about the IP value stream and what it is about. And I will go very fast here. So about the proof, the different stages of, uh, uh, proving from proving the relevance to, to proving the concept, uh, then the, the market positioning and the scalability. This is just to uh, show you uh, the, the, how how we proceed uh, before getting getting to the level of uh, protecting strategy. Because if you protect the strategy, you, you need to understand why we do it, why you do it, and how you will do it. And from here, I would like to very quickly uh, show you a case study a project on which I'm working since several years, which is a biopesticide uh, based on a new strain, but also a new process developed by uh, Tunisian lab and also uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, some other labs in, in Lebanon and in uh, Turkey in particular and in France. And even though the, uh, the bioproduction process war is really uh, very performing and uh, very valuable, it could be protected. The decision to protect the, the process uh, has been uh, just been uh, postponed for one simple reason. If you uh, protect a process, that means that you are disclosing the process. And it is very, very dangerous to disclose the process before starting the industrialization uh, stage. So what we decided do during this project is to protect the strain. So we have an IP, so a patent on the, on the strain, but not in the process. And 
you, I will share with you the document that's for you to, to understand uh, the, the perspective of technology push and market pool. But uh, I will just go through the SWOT analysis and give you the main ideas I would like to share with you. Really, there is uh, uh, an opportunity in the market as the strain is uh, hyper productive and very effective against insect larvae the, compared to the ones in the marketplace. And uh, it looks like the, the, the raw material is available and cheap. Now, the opportunity is that uh, there is an, a, a, an increase in organic uh, product request. But the weakness is that you need to build a new business model to implement this uh, biopesticide. And this is very costly for a startup and uh, the time to market is very long. Uh, beside that, the threat is that competitors, they have deep pockets and it's much easier for someone who is producing uh, pesticides and some, even sometimes fertilizer to kill you if you just enter the market because he has deep pocket and he can reduce the price and make you uh, in a very bad, uh, put you in a very bad position and not easy, not easy to fight against him, unless, unless the government imposed the biopesticide. And this is maybe where there is the difference. And uh, here I come back to what has been said yesterday. If you want to innovate, it's not only about the process itself, it's also about the ecosystem. So when, in, in particular in the WEF, Nexus, we need to have a clustering approach and to think at the same time about the innovation process, but also about the ecosystem that will enable the dissemination and the adoption of uh, the innovation. And thank you very much. Thank you, Munir. This is uh, so interesting and I have to say a little bit inspiring as well. Um, <laughs> It, it is really interesting when you first uh, started the presentation and you were talking about these uh, these uh, research based uh, spin outs and you're saying well because uh, the industry is not always there or not always receptive sometimes you have to do it yourself and uh, and I start thinking well if you want something done right then you have to do it yourself so this this was the na the first natural message and then very quickly the second message came out which is there is a big ecosystem out there so many partners so many resources and really you have to rely on your ecosystem to succeed um, sure. so uh, when it comes to uh, interaction between these entities and the ecosystem what is the best philosophy to adopt what is the best is it wide open doors partner as much as you can or do you have to have a plan first uh, yeah. uh, in fact, there is a principle that you should be applied every time the one who is taking the risk, most of the risk, is the one who should get back the cash back, the most of the cash back. What we are seeing today with this interference between the public sector, private sector, and the agencies and so on, we, we are totally lost who is taking the risk and who is, who is the beneficiary and whatever. Because sometimes in, 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 in this consortium of researchers and uh, some uh, incubators, science, technology or science park, there is a confusion of who will get the, the, the cash back. Yeah. So, so everyone is looking for the grants, focusing on the grant on the short term and not on the long run because no one is really in the capital of the startup. Startup at the end becomes the product and not the engine. Yes, yes. This is a really good statement. The startup is, is the product, not the engine. So with that, I will I will give you your freedom before 3.30. Thank, thank you so much for your presentation. It was really interesting. It's always interesting to see actual examples on the ground. You know, this is, uh, you see people uh, and, and how they react to the different uh, limitations that are out there and not just talk about theory and how things should be done. So thank you again, Mundir. And uh, we release you, you and, to the greater world. I hope I meet you soon again. Huh? Inshallah. Thank you and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.
before uh, I present my next uh, and a very good friend, I have to first of all uh, remind all of the attendees and the participants that I think uh, most, if not all of the speakers are going to be available for one-to-one -one sessions tomorrow as experts. So I advise everybody to utilize the brokerage sessions, to utilize the brokerage uh, platform uh, as much as possible in order to maximize on the rare available such uh, expertise uh, together. So now we have half an hour to go and we have two presentations and uh, this means you get about 14 minutes each. We started with 20, 22 and now we're down to 14. So Salma, I think you probably saw this coming, yeah, <laughs> being the penultimate speaker. But uh, of course, Salma, a very good friend of ours as well, and uh, Ms. Salma Isa, who is the Deputy Director, Research and Innovation Management Department at the Academy of Scientific Research and Technology, a sister organization that we, we are very fond to work with all the time. Of course, with a lot of people, uh, especially Salma, who's, who we are also always happy to, to work with. So. Salma is going to be telling us about the water, energy, food, technology, commercialization, uh, open living labs uh, facing WEF Nexus challenges. And I have to say, we are particularly interested because as you know, one of the open living labs that are being set up now is actually set up uh, by us at Aqaba. So please Salma, the floor is yours. Teach me about these open living labs. Thank you so much, Mr. Jafar, for this very interesting introduction. And actually, yes, I've been studying a little bit the, the, uh, the past few days about the, the topic and how we best approach it. And I, um, I came out with some uh, characteristics that should be available within the uh, living lab we're having. So uh, thank you so much uh, for having me here today. This is a, gives me a great pleasure to be in this interesting event and also be a partner in the, uh, the FIMAC project and Next Lab project. So uh, I only have 14 minutes, so I will start right away. So um, uh, the concept of WIF Nexus is a significant step forward in understanding the complexity of human environment interaction. It has the potential to integrate and in some ways operationalize the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. However, gaps remain in ways to implement change processes that have desirable sustainable outcomes and multiple levels. Many studies confirmed that lack of approaches that seek to operationalize sustainable solution in the urban web nexus, uh, only 4% studies present So um, non-academic actors play a key role in mobilizing change processes in multi-level context systems and the effective integration of nexus research into governance and policy processes. In the domain of sustainable development, that knowledge must be scientifically grounded, credible, relevant and timely, aligned, unbiased and respect the plurality of stakeholders, perspectives and beliefs, legitimate. Non-academic actors can help to uh, indicate knowledge inputs and outputs, the alliance and credibility of outputs and the target of the research. Uh, we recognize that integrating social dynamics into quantitative models is difficult and that Nexus researchers are often already overburdened, overburdened by data. Therefore, we suggest that researchers accept the uncertainty that is inherent in local context specific dynamics and develop pathways that link social and technical projects with higher level Nexus and sustainability goals and agendas. Uh, so, uh, impacts from sustainability intervention in the nexus can appear at any level. Uh, due to the multi-scalar, multi-level interactions inherent in the nexus, therefore the second conceptual shift requires understanding urban with nexus interactions, not only as incoming flows, but also as ongoing impacts. It is important to understand how the nexus system may respond to an intervention. Uh, this thinking reverses the directionality of flow from top-down model where resources flow from source to use to a bottom-up model where the focus is on synergies and trade-offs from use to, to source. Uh, this conceptualization can also help to set boundaries regarding the depth and breadth of social contexts associated with the identified with next.
Um, Salma, you are sometimes dropping Today off. Today is a oh. change. Uh, linking context-specific descriptive analytical research with solution innovation approaches can optimize overall efforts, exploit synergies, and minimize trade-offs in time, energy, and this way would enable purposes and objectives that are co-defined with stakeholders on the ground to be aligned with learning and new knowledge that can be efficiently integrated in the models and tools. Salma, I would like to suggest that you uh, turn off your video while presenting to make sure that your internet remains a little bit more stable. Okay, sure. Because sometimes you drop off. Okay, thank you. So here, uh, okay. So engaging relevant stakeholders at all stages of the solutions processes to align potential solutions with actors who have the capacity to implement them. Although participation takes various forms, it is essential to have a core set of key actors and stakeholders who are in a committed partnership with academic institutions to co-define and co-develop uh, a living lab. Uh, the consumption of the project team is critical also in establishing the credibility, salience, and legitimacy of the outcomes, but it is important to consider this as an open, inclusive, and reflexive process. The Living Lab often exists across multiple contexts, such as social, cultural, political, organizational, and institutional, all of which may have different criteria regarding credibility, salience, and legitimacy. Therefore, it is important to involve and coordinate stakeholders who have the agency and capacity to develop resources in a timely manner. Cultivating also key public and private sectors connections may require a sustained effort to establish trust and buy-in as short and long-term planning coordinating and redundancy are essential also for projects to unfold smoothly. Uh, the third criteria is moving beyond flows and metabolism uh, and engage the behaviors, habits, and social patterns that underpin urban complexity, broadening the descriptive analysis to include patterns of resource use can be key to nexus sustainability. And these patterns are supported by systems and habits that are held in place by culture, society, and individual preferences. So uh, with resources, access, affordability, knowledge, and options are not equally distributed through uh, cities, communities, and populations. Therefore, neither problems nor solutions may lie within the resource system, but in the underlying societal structures that guide development. The underlying casual elements, interaction, and their enabling conditions may be determined by understanding the complexity surrounding resource use. This in turn can open up a dialogue about where to focus efforts to obtain the desired impact. Following on from this, uh, strategies for change can be developed, which may require coordinated efforts uh, across scales, sectors, and levels. Uh, the fourth criteria, and then I'm sorry for the uh, low resolution, but it uh, describes well the, what I need to say. Uh, uh, include next thinking in participatory approaches. The outcome of living lab processes have the potential to be scaled up across systems of provision to achieve sustainability transitions at a large scale, but only if they are incorporated into higher level strategies and agendas, such as the WIF nexus. Identifying cross-level synergies in WIF resources system can open up a new perspective that moves learning to multi-level networks and, and, and municipal and uh, uh, municipal agencies and authorities as well. Understanding such cross-scale and cross-sector trade-off is key uh, to sustainability in the WEF nexus. Living labs are well suited to uncover and taking advantage of synergies between social and material flows. Identifying and understanding the dynamics of interconnections between these flows can have a significant influence on the innovative experimental solutions opens in the living lab and their potential impact. Uh, the fifth characteristics, and this uh, photo is from the Danish uh, uh, Energy Municipality, just an, as an example, uh, to purposefully integrate research results into municipal strategic plans. The implementation of the Nexus agenda would require multi-level coordination of policies and policy fields. It must transcend sectoral divisions and transform approaches to resource use and management. Municipal authorities often have regulatory power over the flow of trade of WIF resources. 
uh, notably infrastructure investment, which is highly relevant to the issues of resources access, affordability, and delivery. So Living Lab would benefit from an institutional level support that can link outcomes to broader sustainability transitions, can ensure that high level agendas are integrated into Living Lab priorities. And that knowledge production is aimed at critical issues such as the sustainable development goals. However, this is not without challenges as skills and time uh, moreover, the municipality must be on board in a variety of labs that might be running at any given time. Also, staff must have the capacity to aggregate the learning and knowledge that is developed and have the agency to translate it into policy and other actions. So taken together, these five and can align the goals of living labs and with in initiatives. They can ensure that living lab outcomes are directly relevant to the uh, broader sustainability strategies while creating pathways for the sustainability transition in the urban with Nexus. Uh, given the multi-scale complexities of the WIF Nexus and the ever-growing importance of cities in a global environmental sustainability, we anticipate an expansion of solution-focused approaches using living labs. Uh, the latter must be con contextually relevant and implementable to meet sustainable and security goals. Our recommendations take into account the potential to integrate transdisciplinary experimentation experiment research at urban and local level with policy strategies. Moreover, including policymakers in the process would heighten and relevance and urgency of WIF Nexus project outcomes. Given the recent surge in interest in the WIF Nexus, of course, we hope that that focus turns toward developing solutions pathway that link levels and the agendas to implement change in policy and practices. The Noodle as well, the Noodle uh, stands for Nexus Driven Open Living Labs can support to bring closer to the market a promising solutions or reformulate solution that failed or for some particular reasons within technology transfer aspects. I've been listening to Mr. Monder and, uh, and all, uh, my other colleagues, of course, Mr. Uh, Zoraci as well. Uh, uh, the ad additional resources of financial of future research and development activities can be solved by living labs. The low financial sustainability of research activities as well. Verification of research results in practical situations, obtaining of a new information sources, contacts, and incentivize for further research, and, and so on and so on. So also uh, one interesting aspect, uh, Mr. Munzer talked about the RBSOs. So uh, that was interesting as actually as one of the uh, uh, characteristics I was saying that uh, this should be, uh, we should implement together, we should have on board the municipalities to, uh, and the public uh, uh, policymakers as well to be on board. It's, it's essential to, uh, uh, to generate and giving an, an a greater output. So Open Living Labs also could be one of the solutions to face uh, with Nexus challenges and facilitate the technological transfer processes. Uh, for example, this is uh, um, some of the uh, uh, the teams that should have in, in the technology transfer offices, for example, coordinate, coordinating between technology users and developer between researchers and manufacturers. So of course that could be happen in living labs, uh, nurture a main integrated ingredient for moving technology from research laboratory to new businesses uh, also can be solved in living labs. And also of course the linkages between them as well. Uh, so uh, to conclude, I hope I didn't exceed my 14 minutes, uh, but um, this is, of course, you are all familiar with the uh, journey of the uh, technology transfer. So invention uh, to, com to be commercialized, commercially feasible technology, uh, technology discovery gap could be overcome by Living Lab. And also when we commercially feasible technology, we have it enhanced and change it to validated business plan. Uh, also Living Lab, Living Lab can also uh, uh, help in commercialization in this commercialization gap. Uh, validating business plan to business to business startup, we we will see actually in the future when we uh, put in line the um, uh, sorry sorry I was cut off sorry. <laughs> So uh, while we, after we validated business plans and change it to business startups, uh, we have uh, the venture launch gap. We will see actually when we implement the um, uh, 
the living lab uh, according to this characteristics I've been uh, offering, I hope we'll see that also this uh, will be uh, overcome by it. Uh, so these are the references for my, my uh, actual research and uh, thank you so much for your time. Oh, you, you will share this, of course, <laughs> these lists of references. This is so interesting. So uh, when, when we were playing around with the idea and starting to develop what's going to happen, of course, you know, in Next Labs, there's, going, there's a living lab in uh, Aqaba, in Jordan, and a living lab in Beirut. And it, it looks like what we were thinking is that this is less a structure and more a community of actors that can... Uh, help this value chain lubricate it and, and is, is this the right approach yes it's we too late to say no by the way but <laughs> this validation is good we're going to sit together and, and uh, go through to, through this together inshallah. fantastic work selva this this is so interesting well done very interesting presentation as as per usual of course as per usual Thank you, Salma. Thank you so much. And thank you for uh, allowing us the grace of uh, giving an at least a relatively fair uh, shot to our final speaker, who, ha who I, I have to say uh, that with, with, of course, with all respect to all of the other speakers today who did a fantastic job so far, uh, the last presentation is the one that I have been looking forward to the most. Okay, and, and this is by our colleague, Ms. Asma Hamouda, who's going to be talking, taking us down to the ground level even more. So uh, we heard about the examples from Munder, we heard about the approaches from Mohammed Diab, the high level from Professor Chadley, the fantastic experience from Alberto and Salma, and now we get our hands dirty with the successes and failures as presented by Asma, who is the technical advisor uh, uh, innovation, Regional Economic Development and Employment Project at uh, GIZ Tunisia. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to finally give you the floor. And I have a feeling that if you take a couple of minutes extra, we, we will not get kicked off exactly <laughs> at 5 p.m. So maybe we have a tiny bit more time to uh, give you your uh, full opportunity to present. So please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Mohammed, um, dear participants, dear uh, partner. I am uh, really pleased to be with you today on the third uh, day of uh, Innovation Week. So my name is At Mohammed from GIZ. Uh, I have been working uh, with uh, GIZ uh, since 2020, uh, 2012, mainly on innovation and uh, technology transfer uh, in Tunisia. <laughs> I started with the Passive project, uh, then we had the IDE project about which I am uh, presenting today. And soon uh, we will have the CQE project uh, starting officially on uh, February 1st, 2022, also dealing with uh, this uh, three level team, micro, meso, and uh, macro. Uh, so, uh, IDE project, Innovation, uh, Regional Economic Development and Employment, part of GIZ cluster, private sector promotion and uh, financial system development, including the 15 different projects dealing with um, sustainable tourism, financial inclusion, digital transformation, among others. Um, uh, IDE project uh, started in um, uh, uh, 2015 and is ending on uh, January 31st, 2022. Uh, I think uh, it's my uh, last presentation about the IDEA project. Uh, it is managed, managed in uh, partnership with the Ministry of Industry and um, aims to support the economic performance of companies in selected sectors. Uh, this project has three main activities, namely support to the value chain, uh, support uh, to companies in field, uh, fields like uh, marketing, uh, HR development, uh, innovation and technology transfer, and produce, uh, introduction of uh, digital tools, uh, etc., and the career readers of students. Um, when it comes to technology transfer, uh, 
dedicated to introducing innovation in industrial companies, tar target of uh, eBay project. A support program uh, has been developed by experts in the field and all interventions uh, have been uh, guaranteed in accordance to this program previously tested and validated in the pilot phase in 2015. Um, the goal of uh, this program uh, is to support selected companies first in detecting their needs in terms of technology transfer via a uh, diagnose and uh, then introducing innovate uh, chance in the product or the uh, or the process or anything else using technology transfer via collaborative research uh, such as knowledge and the know-how transfer between tunisian company and tunisian uh, university uh, this program includes uh, six steps uh, first step is uh, farming and starting the project. Uh, second uh, step is evaluating the potential and development perspectives of the company, so uh, a detailed analysis of its business model. Um, the third uh, one is um, uh, identification of the technology transfer needs and innovation opportunities. Uh, the company approves the selected project in order to establish the functional performance specification. The um, fourth step is about technology transfer. There is um, a pre-selection of uh, research structure according to the company preferences, uh, if any, or according to their field, or to the recommendation of the Ministry of Education and Scientific Research uh, Tunisian Ministry. Uh, then uh, we present the framework of the responsible uh, person of the preselected resource structure without uh, extensive detail, while starting with them the possibility of launching a collaborative research project. As soon um, as we get an agreement in principle from the research structure, an NDA is signed and meetings are planned with the team of the company and the team of the research structure in order to present and start with the functional performance specification. After, uh, after the related study of the functional performance specification, the research structure then prepares a technical and a financial offer. The, financial, uh, the technical offer uh, will be extensively organized in order to exhibit different layer-step uh, scenarios satisfying the requirements of the functional performance specification. Uh, during this step, we uh, help to the we um, the IDE project help the two partners studying and validating the technical offer and negotiate the financial offer if needed that has to be paid by the company. Uh, soon after uh, the validation uh, of every aspect needed, the jurist write, write the color color. color Collaborative Research Agreement, called CFC, and within the goal of the partnership that is of each team, uh, state of the art technology before the beginning of the project, intellectual property rights, financial condition, uh, timeline, etc. Uh, this step, the, the step of technology transfer, is um, finalized by signing the CFC uh, Collaborative uh, Research Agreement. Uh, the five uh, steps is about following the project pro pro progression according to the CFC specification, sometimes requiring amendment. The last uh, step is the uh, ending of project and uh, evaluation. Uh, the technical support of uh, this program is the technical support of eBay project. It has an average of um, uh, 15 men day. It is being assured by the eBay project through mobilization, mobilization of expert consultants. But um, the financial cost of the project, financial offer presented by the research structure, is at the charge of the company.
so with this um, uh, with this program, uh, this program interested uh, 134 company in Tunisia, industrial company. Uh, 103 company uh, benefited from the diagnosis step, the second step. Uh, only 93 companies have identified an innovative project that has been defined in the functional specification documents, and only 34 uh, collaborative research agreements uh, were signed. signed. So we can say uh, that we have um, 100 failure stories and 34 success stories. Um, example of um, success story of uh, the project, uh, we have an uh, agri-food company uh, have signed an agreement with the INSAT for a project called the optimization of the formula and the manufacturing process of data bread produced on a laborat uh, laboratory sale. Uh, second one uh, is about the plastic transformation company uh, has signed uh, an agreement with the ENIS, with the uh, engineering school, for a project called the recycling valorization of uh, plastic waste. Uh, plastic waste. Uh, uh, another one is um, about electronic company uh, which has signed the agreement with the STIC for a project called um, development, control, and uh, optimization of the brazing techniques. Um, this project was successfully, uh, successfully conducted by a partner, a partner for whom they their interest in continuing the collab collaboration. Um, I finish uh, with um, uh, the K uh, the K success factors and the K failure factors based on the experience of the ID project. Um, the success stories were mainly based on the following points. At the level of the company, uh, the dedicated department or position for research and development, and the existence of a need for uh, technology transfer in order to innovate. Uh, at the level of the business management, uh, excellent technical leadership skills. Uh, wildness uh, to implement uh, the proposed project, and at the level of research partner, uh, flexibility of the research partner while conducting its research, and the research partner up to date with the la latest development in the sector. Uh, about um, failure story uh, are generally caused by no compliance with um, collaborative research agreements, item, uh, terms and clauses, uh, financial capacity, low financial capacity of the selected companies, and the blocking of funding uh, mechanisms, some of the uh, funding mechanisms in Tunisia, uh, industrial managers' lack of confidence in the graduate student skills. Uh, lack of uh, involvement of the industrial manager to finance technology transfer innovate, uh, innovation project. And at the level of the research partner, no comp compliance with the contract and flexibility of research, uh, researcher in delivering project uh, documents, long ne negotiation period, and lack of responsiveness. And also sometimes we have uh, excessively expensive financial offers. Um, it's uh, our uh, experience of ID project, uh, the result of uh, this uh, this uh, project. Mm, thank you for your uh, attention, and uh, feel free uh, to uh, to um, to ask or to. Uh, uh, to reach me for uh, further detail, my contact information are available with the CCC. <laughs> Thank, thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Hamouda. This is a, a very interesting project, and I have to start by saying that uh, you had 134 companies entering into the program, and yes. you had 34 agreements. Yes, so this is a, 25 yes. percent is to, for me. 25% is a high percentage of 
realizing industry academia agreements structures in place this is not an easy thing to do and i congratulate you on this uh, outcome it's, uh, it is really not easy clearly you put a lot of effort into that this is this does not happen on its own so for the first thing that i want to say is that i believe the percentage is high and you should be proud of it this is the first thing that i will say but the second thing that I will say is building on what you said. You said it's uh, 34 success stories and 100 less, less success, less success. I mean, not failures, but uh, unrealized potential. So my question to you is how do you change the 34 into 100? And 34. How, what what can we do? Concrete steps. If you look at the program, is it through the different program design, or do we need to add uh, more mechanisms, or do we need to choose the companies better? What can we do to increase this percentage? I think it's uh, the, the most uh, big problem is about the financial. So we need uh, more mechanism in Tunisia. And like um, uh, Mr. Shirley said uh, later, uh, we have uh, many things to change in Tunisia about the um, uh, 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 condition of cadre, so, 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 some uh, regs, some uh, yeah. and uh, about uh, some um, um, material expertise uh, like uh, uh, innovate, innovate manager, like a property intellectual. We have uh, uh, if we um, we uh, we can change and improve this uh, this um, uh, aspect. I think we we, we can uh, uh, increase uh, the number of uh, of CRC and the number of uh, success story uh, like. Uh, very interesting. And I like your answer when where you're not talking about just finance in general. Specific financial instruments can make a difference. So yes, financial instruments for innovation uh, projects. Yeah. Not, uh, not financial mechanism for uh, technical support or yes, for uh, yes. uh, we need uh, financial for uh, innovative project and innovation project to to uh, to motivate the company to to innovate. <laughs> I 100% I, I agree. And I always say that this is probably the best money that can be spent in a government. Because when you give a little bit of financial incentive to a small company, a startup or an SME, the impact is, is fantastic. Job creation is very quick and you can realize uh, value immediately. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Very interesting project, really. And uh, I, I'll have to say, uh, the, uh, unfortunately, it, it gives me no joy to close today because we've had some really good presentations. But uh, unless uh, anybody of the speakers would like to give uh, any final thoughts, uh, okay, then I will uh, say my last minute and then thank everybody. First of all, I have to say that we saw today technology transfer how it can work in so many different uh, institutions in so many different ways and in so many different uh, uh, mechanisms. We also saw that technology transfer is also a tool that can be utilized by startups. So I have to add the one third uh, layer to what uh, Mundir Khanfir was saying. It's either you find industry to do it or you do it yourself, yes or you do it yourself to find industry to do it. So you can actually spin out a research-based uh, spin-off in order to uh, implement technology transfer. So there's nothing wrong with that. And this is something that we're seeing more and more often now, uh, startups requesting technology transfer support in order to engage larger industry. Uh, I have to say also that we saw that the variety of mechanisms in which uh, technology transfer can support, but also can be supported. And I have to say here that uh, when we uh, closed with uh, uh, Ms. Hamouda, we also saw that uh, it's not it's it's a question about matching the company's needs with the program, matching the program activities with the, with the need to partner, but also matching the financing mechanisms with the, with the obstructions that are out there. And here. Uh, 
I have to say that these are everywhere. Uh, research is risky, otherwise it's not research. Uh, Spin-outs are risky, otherwise they're not spin-outs. Uh, in order to move forward, we need to, first of all, work together outside of our silos and engage directly with, with everybody around us. I have to say also that uh, the, the uh, brokerage session tomorrow afternoon is a very rare opportunity for uh, all of you participants to reach out and have one-to-one -one meeting with all of these different uh, fantastic experts that we have been hearing from over the past three days. And I encourage everybody to reach out and ask a question, make a connection, uh, request for some assistance. This is what it takes to move the world forward. In the end, I have to thank, first of all, all of the speakers. You have all done uh, us a great favor by giving us so much uh, knowledge so gracefully and so graciously. And I have to thank, of course, uh, our colleagues, the organizers uh, at uh, the Chamber of, uh, of, of Commerce of Central Tunisia, CCIC. And uh, I have to say, we call ourselves co uh, co uh, co-designers uh, or, or, or co-implementers of this, but really the, 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 uh, our partners in Tunisia have done an amazing job putting this together. Uh, of course, I have to thank uh, the coordinators and all of the partners within the two projects. Uh, first of all, Next Labs, which is today and tomorrow, but also WEFCAP, which is the, the last two days. These are two really interesting projects that, uh, uh, that are trying to change the facts on the ground. Because I am the chair and I'm allowed to say whatever I want, I would also like to invite you to keep an eye out for a new project coming out now. It's called WEFCAP. And it's uh, about capitalization of water, energy, food uh, innovation. So this is a, a third instrument that, uh, that is an ENI CBC Med project, uh, like a, almost like a sister project to, to Next Labs, but uh, taking the capitalization approach forward. So keep your eyes out. This is going to be very active very soon. And finally, of course, I have to thank the European Union for their funding of this, uh, uh, the projects and this activity and uh, for the government of Tunisia for all its support. Uh, and thank you for having attended this fantastic session. Uh, I bring this session to the close and uh, I hope to see you again, hopefully in person sometime in the near future. Thank you everybody and have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.